Hello, this is part four of the Lipid Injectable Emulsion Survey with Gap Analysis that will focus on repackaging of intravenous lipid emulsions. My name is Kathleen Gura and I'm a clinical pharmacist within the Division of Gastroenterology, Hepatology and Nutrition at Boston Children's Hospital and I also serve as the Manager for Clinical Research within the Department of Pharmacy. This presentation is based on the results of a survey that was published in Nutrition and Clinical Practice in October of 2017 titled Lipid Injectable Emulsion Survey with Gap Analysis. It was actually the result of a survey that was intended to publish current data from clinicians on how intravenous lipid products are prescribed, prepared, and administered to patients in a variety of healthcare settings, and then to prepare a gap analysis between current practice and published recommendations and guidelines. This survey was developed by the PN Safety Committee within ASPEN and its content was validated by select content experts and the ASPEN Clinical Practice Committee. A survey was sent by email using SurveyMonkey to ASPEN members in the U.S. in October of 2016 and kept open for approximately one month with two reminder emails. The survey consisted of 70 different questions divided in four different domains, uh, one of sample characteristics, those pertaining to adult patients, those related to ch children and adolescent patients, and finally neonatal and infant patients. The survey study was approved by the University of Tennessee's Institutional Review Board as an exempt study and therefore did not require consent. The survey was voluntary and anonymous and the answers were aggregated for reporting purposes. The survey data is actually summarized using descriptive uh, statistics within the paper. In the U.S., the currently available products are supplied by the manufacturer in either 100, 250, or 500 mil containers. None of these are suitable for use in neonates, who typically receive doses of 10 to 20 mils per day, usually administered separate from the dextrose protein admixture, and total nutrient admixtures in general are typically not possible due to compatibility concerns. As a result of this practice, the use of the original manufacturer's container puts neonates and infants at risk for overdose and rapid infusion. In fact, intravenous lipid emulsion infusion errors are a leading cause of medication errors among pediatric patients. In the one study between January 2000 and December 31, 2005, a total of 54 of the 173 hospitals, or 30%, participating in the MedMark uh, study reported errors involving intravenous lipid emulsions. Oftentimes, they were the result of human error, infusion pump programming errors, such as switching the infusion rate of the PN with that of the lipid, a misconnection of the tubing, or simply a device failure. Uh, this graphic is from my institution at Boston Children's Hospital that demonstrates a worst case scenario of a setup for PN, intravenous lipid emulsions, and a host of medications into a single lumen of a central venous catheter. And as you can see, just by the complexity of the setup, there are numerous opportunities for misconnections or setting the infusion rates of the pumps wrong and thus putting children and neonates at greater risk for lipid emulsion infusion related errors. One of the concerns that is present when you infuse lipid emulsion separate from the dextrose protein solution is that of fat overload syndrome which could occur when lipids are rapidly infused. It's a well-known complication of IV lipid emulsion therapy and could occur when the lipid infusion rate exceeds 0.17 grams per kilo per hour. As you may recall, when IV lipid emulsions are infused, they are cleared like natural chylomicrons. The rate limiting step in this process is the amount of lipoprotein lipase present. This enzyme is produced within the capillary endothelium. In a healthy adult, the maximum clearance rate is typically 3.8 grams per kilo per day. However, in neonates, especially those that are critically ill, they have ad inadequate lipoprotein lipase stores and are as a result are prone to hypertriglyceridemia even when lipids are infused at a normal rate. 
and that is one of the reasons why we, we often will infuse IV lipid emulsions over 24 hours in this population. In most cases, when lipids are rapidly infused, you only will see a sudden elevation of serum triglyceride levels that will resolve when you stop the infusion of the lipid emulsion. However, in cases of fat overload syndrome, you will see fever, hepatosplenomegaly, coagulopathies, respiratory failure, metabolic acidosis, and organ dysfunction that oftentimes can result in a fatal outcome. Based on these concerns, typically some method of repackaging has been used for dispensing lipid emulsions. In fact, most respondents of this survey, 59.3% of the pediatric and 70.7% of the infant respondents, reported that they manipulated the manufacturer's original container either by repackaging into a syringe or drawing down from the original container prior to administration. Less than half of the respondents, only 40.7%, infused the IV lipid emulsion directly from the original container. Based on the results of the survey, repackaging is the most common practice in many pediatric programs, and lipid emulsions are repackaged into syringes. There are several benefits with this approach, one being that smaller volumes are able to be delivered and thus decrease the risk of an overinfusion. There's less waste of the lipid emulsion itself, and it's easier to infuse two separate 12-hour doses over a 24-hour period and thus be in compliance with the CDC recommendation of not, not hanging on a, a lipid emulsion that's separate from the dextrose amino acid admixture for no more than 12 hours. However, because of all the manipulations involved in the repackaging process, there's also an increased risk of contamination. In fact, unlike the dextrose amino acid components that are hypertonic that can suppress microbial growth, lipid emulsions are isotonic and nutrient rich and thus are a great vehicle for microbial growth. Typical contaminants that have been known to thrive in lipid emulsions include E. coli, Staph epidermidis, diphtheroids, microcoxi, malathesia furfur, and candida albicans. In one study, it was demonstrated that single-use packaging of lipid emulsions that were inoculated with opportunistic bacteria serratia as well as cepatia had considerable microbial proliferation. And in fact, as mentioned previously, based on the potential risk for infection, in 1996, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention recommended that the 12-hour hang time be used for lipid emulsions that are infused separate from the dextrose and amino acid solution. Another approach for repackaging lipid emulsions involves using an automated compounding device rather than manually repackaging a syringe, and this has been evaluated in one study conducted by Gordon Sachs and his team. In that study, researchers evaluated the sterility of a small volume intravenous lipid emulsions that we repackage into empty IV containers using an automatic compounder. Once repackaged, the bags were subjected to immediate microbial analysis at zero hours, 12 hours, 24 hours, and 120 hours. This storage procedure matched clinical practice of hanging the P lipid bag at zero hours, completing a 12-hour infusion, failing to change a 12-hour infusion, which would be similar to a 24-hour infusion, and storing the bag under refrigeration for up to five days, which often occurs with patients receiving home PM. Despite minimizing touch contamination, microbial growth occurred in 12 of the 152 repackaged preparations were compared with zero with the unmanipulated controls. The third approach for repackaging lipid emulsions is called the drawn down method. This is the practice of delivering the final volume in the original manufacturer's container by removing the excess fluid. The benefits include less manipulations involved in preparing the product, thus there's less risk of contamination. The potential risks include that you cannot easily confirm the final volume of the product, and there's also the increased risk of waste with the removed lipid emulsion because it cannot be used for another purpose. 
This table summarizes the approaches used by respondents when it comes to repackaging lipid emulsions. The majority did repackage lipids into syringes. Uh, most did repackage into syringes and infuse that syringe for a maximum of 24 hours, while others would repackage syringes and infuse no more than 12 hours per a single syringe. Those who repackaged into using the drawn down method using the manufacturer's original container were less common, but again, some respondents did use a single container up to 24 hours, while others would not use a single drawn down container from more than 12 hours and the rest of the respondents used other techniques and hang times. So what is the best practice when it comes to repackaging lipid emulsions? Obviously, to re-minimize the risk of nosocomial infections due to contamination, repackaged lipid emulsions should be hung no more than 12 hours in accordance to the CDC recommendations. If a patient does require a 24-hour infusion of IV lipid emulsions, they should be divided into two 12-hour containers, with the second container that's not being used being refrigerated immediately after preparation until it is used. The repackaging should always be done using the same sterile technique that's used to prepare PN as per USP 797. Of course, our recommendation would also be that manufacturers manufacture IV lipid emulsions in smaller volumes that would allow us not to have to repackage into smaller containers. These are some references and resources you might like to look into further if you are reevaluating the process you use currently in your institution. In closing, I would like to remind you that this four-part program was brought to you by Aspen's Parental Nutrition Safety Committee and was supported with a grant from the Fresenius Cabe USA LLC. Thank you and have a good day.